The overuse of antibiotics has been likened to a slow-motion tsunami, a wave of devastation that, according to some, could annihilate human populations. Are we entering a post-antibiotic world? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. It was the dawn of a new era in medicine. The first antibiotics prescribed in the 1930s, astonishing results. Death rates dropped dramatically, life expectancy going up by as much at that time as eight years. But in trying to save ourselves from deadly infections, have we inadvertently exposed ourselves to more risk? As our bodies become more resistant to antibiotics, one major study says 10 million people could die every year by 2050. They're made in their trillions to fight deadly bacteria. For almost a hundred years, antibiotics have saved countless lives. But for how much longer? We are witnessing the rise of the superbug, where some bacteria are becoming resistant to drugs. The medicine cabinet is empty for some patients. It is the end of the road for antibiotics unless we act urgently. Scientists are warning us of an antibiotic apocalypse, a world in which common infections become untreatable and medicine is plunged back into the dark ages. The breakthrough came after six years' work by a British drug firm. Scientists claim that it can do all that penicillin does and more. There have been few breakthroughs in antibiotics. Research is expensive. But so are superbugs. Europe alone is spending more than $1.3 billion a year treating them. Doctors say the problem is made worse by over-prescribing antibiotics and poor hospital hygiene. The more we look at drug resistance, the more concerned we are. We need to do a very comprehensive job protecting antibiotics so that we can have them and our children can have them. The long-term overuse of antibiotics in animals has triggered a disturbing development. In 2015, an antibiotic-resistant strain of E. coli emerged on a pig farm in China. They had been pumped for years with the antibiotic colistin, which was used as a growth hormone. Since then, a number of other animals and humans have developed a resistance to colistin, often used as a last resort when other drugs aren't effective. We need to make new antibiotics, but unless we have better stewardship and better identification of outbreaks, we will lose these miracle drugs. There's growing concern that resistance to antibiotics will become more prevalent. New antibiotics are being made, but scientists still point to the fact that they're being overprescribed. That, they say, will only lead to increased resistance. And if that happens, we may be facing the spectre of untreatable infections. Joining me at the round table today, Martha Henriquez, a science and health reporter for the International Business Times, who believes that new antibiotics simply aren't being made because there are no profits there. Dr. Kira Costello is from Imperial College London, specializes in antimicrobial resistance, and backs up the suggestion that it could well kill more people than cancer by 2050. Dr. Peter Fisher from the Royal London Hospital for Integrated Medicine says non traditional medicines and other alternatives should be where we're looking. And next to him is Richard Daywood, a practicing doctor who thinks technology could help with the problem. Thank you all very much for coming in to Roundtable. Uh, Dr. Costello, let me put this to you first of all. How did we get to this point? Um, well, it's probably worth noting from the start that this isn't really a new phenomenon. So Sir Alexander Fleming himself warned about the imposing threat of antimicrobial resistance back in the day when he discovered penicillin. Um, and he specifically warned that if we didn't utilize antibiotics appropriately, if we misused them, that we could really fuel this, this later stage antimicrobial resistance. So we should have seen this coming? In a way, we were warned. And of course, what's happened is, as mentioned in, in the program, is that there's been indiscriminate and um, overuse of these antibiotics, and that perhaps the time has come that we should really consider um, utilizing them in a more sensible way. Who, who wants to answer the question, who's to blame here? Not doctors. <laughs> The, a lot of the overuse and misuse of uh, antibiotics 
at a global level has been through widespread use in agriculture to increase meat yields in, in farming. Um, so I, I think number one, agricultural use, particularly now in Asia. Um, and then although we're being very diligent about uh, antibiotic stewardship in Western countries, there is absolutely indiscriminate and uncontrolled medical use of antibiotics in countries where regulatory systems don't apply. We will get into the, the China and agriculture debate a little bit later on, I hope, because I know, Martha, you've got a couple of interesting points you want to make here. But, but Peter Fisher, you, you're into alternative medicines and, and homeopathy. Do, do you believe that antibiotics have had a place, or would you rather they never had come along in the first place? Well, first of all, we should be talking about antimicrobial resistance, not antibiotics. Of course, mostly it's antibiotics, but there are also antiviral and antifungal drugs which come under the heading of antimicrobial resistance. And no, they're wonderful drugs which have saved many millions of lives. Uh, the problem is that they're overused, they're used inappropriately, and I have to disagree slightly with Richard. The, the medical profession does bear some blame for that of indiscriminate overuse. Um, but when you look at the reports, a very good report by Lord Jim O'Neill, my problem with it is it's too narrow. It's more, more, do the same, more of the same, do the same, better. We need to take a wider approach. We need to think about boosting the resistance of patients um, or, or making them more resilient. And that is something that can be done with, with various forms of complementary medicine. Well, Jim O'Neill, who, who wrote the report to which you referred, said we need new drugs to replace the ones that aren't working. We haven't seen a truly new class of antibiotics for decades. A doctor will tell me uh, perhaps why that is a good thing, why we need that. But as a business reporter, you've investigated this, Martha, and you, you say it's just there's no money in it. So why, why bother? I mean, the antibiotic um, research and development pipeline um, for finding new antibiotics is an incredibly expensive process. So it could take a pharmaceutical company hundreds of millions of dollars of investment to come up with um, a viable new antibiotic. And then, as we know, if we overuse those antibiotics and we prescribe them indiscriminately or they're used in agriculture um, indiscriminately, we very quickly end up with resistance and a situation where the drug so is no longer So they become viable. obsolete pretty quickly, Very almost quickly. before they, they've started to make some money out of them. How do, how do you get around that problem? Well, Jim O'Neill actually has a background. He's, a, he's an economist, economist, a banker. Yeah, he's a Goldman Sachs. So he, his report did look at that a bit. I, I agree. You know, the economic incentives are important. And he, he mm -hmm. did address that point, which was welcome. But, but even so, I think it's yeah. Yeah. medically. Yeah. And that also, you get I, I just want to make the point also that it's not just misuse of antibiotics or overuse that leads to the problem. We've now got a situation where microbes can actually transfer uh, resistant genes amongst themselves. So even without, the, uh, you know, even with correct and appropriate use, we still have uh, a looming problem, which is. Uh, you know, th 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 there is this ability now for um, microbes to mix and match their genes so you can get um, transfer of resistance to an organism that has never actually been exposed to an antibiotic. You wanted to say something, Kira? Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I think the answer to this problem isn't more drugs. I actually think what we can do is ensure that where we are prescribing and where antibiotics need to be used, that they're um, prescribed according to the correct dose so we have you know we very limited knowledge about dosing in particular subsets of our patient population that's a problem duration recently in the media there's been reports about um, advice that's given to patients about the duration of treatment when it comes to antibiotics so I think there's much more research that we can do to ensure that when we are giving an antibiotic that's a, that is an appropriate dose and appropriate duration and the appropriate choice of antibiotics. Uh, and we'll get on to that in just a moment but let me refer back to something that we attributed to you that you agreed with the fact that by 2015 I mean, 10 million people a year could be dying because of antimicrobial resistance. Give us a picture of what you think the world would be like if that was the case. Yeah, I mean, well, we're into a scenario where routine surgeries come with a great, great risk. So, you know, hospital stays, um, you know, um, as, and associated health impacts um, with antimicrobial resistance would just be through the roof, essentially. Um, you know, best estimates at the moment are about 75,000 patients dying across the UK and the EU from these infections. Um, we've, got, we've got limited amounts of data as to um, how many patients are actually dying. So the 10 million is an estimate, but it's, 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 not, it's not an unreasonable estimate. You have alternative medicine as a solution there. Don't you? 
Well, as a contribution. I mean, I, oh, I agree okay. with you know, better antibiotic osmotic, developing new antibiotics if we can. And it's been 30 years since, as you said, since a new class was introduced. But I think we should need to be looking at host factors, in other words, boosting the resistance of, of patients. We did a study looking at echinacea, and ech echinacea is a herb, actually originates with the North American natives, head-to-head um, -head with Tamiflu in flu. And what you see is it's at least as effective um, and fewer side effects. Uh, and one of the interesting things, if you look at the data on Tamiflu, the, the main, main treatment for, for flu, is that it doesn't work when you really need it to. It works relatively well in young, healthy people, but if you look at vulnerable groups, older people with chronic diseases, it works much less well. So what we need to think about is, is the host, the, the, the patient themselves, not, not killing bugs, but strengthening Building up resistance? Yes. Or in some cases, actually reducing, in some cases, sometimes it's over, it's an overreaction of the immune system. Sometimes you actually need to damp it down. But, but host factors, things coming from the patient, not just killing bugs, but thinking about the, the person who's got the bugs. What about this identifying the precise thing that's wrong with you that you two were talking about? Yeah, so again, I think we're kind of driving towards talking about personalised medicine and considering an individual patient as opposed to a population of patients. Um, and I think there's, there's certainly um, research around point of care diagnostic tests that can rapidly um, ascertain whether it's a virus or a bacteria, if it's a bacteria what type potentially, if it's a bacteria whether it's going to be sensitive to a panel of different um, antibiotics. So I think that's quite an exciting You do this already research. Richard? Yes, I've brought along today a couple of, you know, an example of this. So this no infectious diseases? Is nothing, <laughs> this is pristine. But all you need is the tiniest um, sample because what you're doing, is, the, the, the latest technology uses essentially what's a DNA test. You're looking for the genetic material of the organisms um, that cause disease. Um, now, the old technology was to try and grow these things in uh, a, a lab, which would take a matter of days, two, three days, perhaps, before you could then identify the organisms that had grown, or looking at them under the microscope. But now what you can actually do is take the tiniest sample um, and compare it with the, uh, a template of the organisms that you're looking for and then boost uh, anything that's found to a point where it can be detected easily. Now we already do this in, in my practice. We can, so uh, these two examples, the blue one is for looking at uh, stool samples. We can take a tiny uh, dab of um, stool sample from somebody who's got a gut infection and within an hour, we can identify any one of uh, 22 different organisms. So that's viruses, bacteria, parasites. And what that means... Sorry to cut you a little bit short, but does this mean that um, you have to have, A, a lot of money to come and see somebody like you? Um, and, and thirdly, that if you're offering this, why isn't it readily available for everybody? Are, are governments taking this seriously enough? Because it sounds sort of... Uh, apocalyptic what we're looking well, at. Well, so um, I think the costs will come down, but the beauty of it is, it is that it means that you don't give antibiotics to people who've got viral infections, uh, you don't give the wrong kind of antibiotic to somebody, you don't give antibiotics to people who've got a parasitic uh, cause of their diarrhoea, and you can identify quickly people who don't have an infective cause at all. It's not going to solve the problem per se, but it might help well, alleviate, it allows alleviate you, it. It allows you to target yeah. the treatment. What about the use of antibiotics in animals, which is what we are coming around to, it being possibly the biggest cause of, of uh, antimicrobial resistance. What do you think as a, you know, a supporter of alternative medicine when you see this happening? Well, it's reprehensible, isn't it? It's not allowed in the European Union, but uh, who knows what's going on in China and indeed in the States. That's the problem. So I think it's a major driver. Why did it start? Well, um, animals uh, suffer bacterial infections just like people do, um, particularly in very large intensive farms. Um, pigs and cows um, can quite easily contract um, infections, especially in cows uh, TB, for example. And what happens if they get um, treated for that? What happens to us if we eat their meat? Well, there are questions about if we are breeding um, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria in these cows or other livestock, could it potentially um, cause a resistant infection in humans if we do consume that meat? As far as I know, there aren't many conclusive studies saying that that has happened. 
um, but it's certainly a risk factor. And if you look at the amount of antibiotics being fed um, to livestock, you know, in the US and places like China, it's really an astonishing amount. So you could say that it might mm. be an accident waiting to happen. Sure. I think I, I agree. I think that there's limited evidence around that transmission route through consumption of, of animal products that have been fed antibiotics. Mm. But what is worrying is um, effluent from farms that ends up in, in the water system. And that's a really big risk factor. And we've yet to see, we've yet to accumulate the data and model to see what proportion of the burden of AMR is caused by wastewater and what's coming that's off That's antimicrobial farming. resistance. Essentially AMR. what you've got is a low level of antibiotic presence in the environment that, that tends to breed, encourage resistant organisms mm -hmm. to flourish. So and that's of course, the concern. Uh, the bacteria, in evolutionary terms, bacteria cheat. They don't, you know, evolve from generation to generation. They can pass immunity uh, to uh, antimicrobial resistance within a generation, from each other to each other, by small and packages of DNA. They actually get stronger as well, don't they, sometimes? Uh, yes, but certainly the, the point is that, you know, it can, it, you don't, it's not from generation to generation. It's within the same generation they pass DNA from each other. So if you breed, you know, give a lot of antibiotics to farm animals and breed, you know, some resistant bacteria that way, they can, those bacteria can then pass that resistance to other bacteria within the same generation, not from generation to generation. Well, why have we not banned, as a, as a global community, antibiotics in animals? I mean, you, you, you pick out an example of pigs in China. They, they've actually managed to, to behave rather well with that. Um, because antibiotic resistance and the use of last resort antibiotics in pigs was a really big problem. Um, for example, pigs were being fed so much antibiotics that the amount that they excreted, so just passing straight through their system, was actually the equivalent of an adult daily dose of antibiotics. So it's a huge amount that they're but they being stopped fed. This? So obviously, um, with a sort of uh, the Chinese system of government, um, they can be quite quick to tackle a problem um, when they see it. So. Um, uh, you know, very comprehensive efforts to tackle the amount of antibiotics being used in the pig's feed, and it has massively uh, reduced the problem. But if this problem, as you, as you mentioned, Peter, is, is being addressed in the European Union but not elsewhere, why is it not being addressed elsewhere? Well, actually, there have been initiatives um, in the veterinary community in the UK that have been quite successful. So there's been, I think, a 70% reduction in antibiotic use in poultry farming and a similar reduction um, in pig farming. And I think the next... Um, stage of that is to look at cattle farming um, and to try and um, introduce antibiotic stewardship um, in that community. So there are, there are initiatives underway that are having some success. Um, but we have we gone too far to, to turn the clock back? Hopefully not. I mean, I, I think we need to also look at alternatives. There's a nice study done in Wagen, in University of Wagen in, in Holland, where they looked at diarrhea in, in newborn piglets which is a big, big problem and often gets treated with antibiotics. Farmers don't like it because it slows down the rate at which they gain weight. So they got this homeopathic medicine and it wasn't, you know, the lap dog kind of homeopathy. They sprayed it on the sow's vulvas, not, not very genteel, but it enormously reduced the incidence of diarrhea in these newborn piglets. You can't argue with that, can you? Well, I think as well, it, it's better dosing in, in the agricultural, in the kind of food production industry. So um, there are new kind of ways that are incorporating new technology in order to ensure that an, an individual chicken is getting the correct <laughs> deeded, then defined daily dose of antibiotic therapy, whereas before it was quite indiscriminate use of antibiotics. And I think this might be um, more possible in places like the EU and the US where there might be the money um, to use these kind of high-tech solutions in agriculture. But looking further perhaps to the developing world where these technologies aren't accessible, um, you know, the farmer still has to try and make a profit and they want to keep their animals well. Mm. So if they don't have access to these technologies, How do you get difficult. around the sense that people go to the doctor expecting to be given antibiotics and are disappointed if they don't get them, no matter what is wrong with them? Well, I think that, uh, no, I think fault? I think that uh, uh, people are a lot more educated these days, and and Some don't, are. D well, I, 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 my impression is that that is 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 changing. I, I think uh, a, a lot of the time, I think we are actually may, maybe doctors a bit too harsh, uh, not giving antibiotics when they are appropriate. Um, uh, so all the stories about them sort of just being hard pushed for time and saying, yes, Mrs. Muggins, I'm going to give you uh, this packet of pills are apocryphal. Mm. 
I, I, I definitely see doctors who are perhaps too unkind when it comes to people with distressing symptoms like urinary infections or, you know, that, that could actually be relieved by antibiotics. You know, I think we're making, we sometimes are in danger of making our own patients pay the penalty for antibiotic misuse elsewhere. I, I slightly worry about diagnostic testing in that, with that question in mind, because I think for the vast majority of uncomplicated respiratory tract infection, for example. <coughs> for a doctor to make the decision not to prescribe is, is fine for the most part. There's been studies done that show there's no kind of unintended consequences associated with that decision. And I do wonder if we introduce this sort of environment where patients expect a diagnostic test every time they come to a GP practice, that that will somehow fuel their, their mm. desire to have these, these drugs, when actually the evidence exists for the majority mm. of patients that the doctor can make the decision mm. not to prescribe. What about but vaccines? But you don't it adds up anybody who believes that vaccines are a way forward. I think, um, for example, research at the University of Sheffield in the UK, people are developing vaccines for MRSA, um, which can be a, a difficult... Which is what we call the super... Well, what is the proper name for the superbug that you see in hospitals? Um, yes, yeah, so there have been outbreaks in the UK and elsewhere of um, MRSA. Um, and it's quite a difficult and long process to develop an accurate vaccine, a vaccine that will sort of really tackle the issue. And that but people don't like vaccines. They've got a bad rap, haven't they? That's a sort of a different issue entirely. The vast mm. body of scientific ev evidence is behind the fact that um, there was this link between um, uh, the MMR vaccine and autism, which has been uh, discredited multiple times over. But mm. yes, there is public sentiment against vaccines for children. Talking about uh, public and sentiment, let me bring in Peter, if I, if mm. I may here, Richard. Um, there still, still seems to be some sort of antipathy towards the alternative medicine sector. Does that infuriate you? Yes, and, and what annoys me is that the research is ignored. There is considerable bodies of research which are simply ignored. We know, for instance, one of the major uh, sources of inappropriate use of antibiotics is otitis media, in ear infections in children, and yet GPs frequently still use antibiotics for that. It shouldn't be used. We know that uh, GPs who use complementary medicine are much less inclined to, to prescribe uh, antibiotics and get the same results actually at lower cost. Are we just being a bit fatalistic here and sort of saying, well, there's not very much we can do? I mean, everybody's sitting here calmly talking about effectively the end of modern medicine as, as we know it. Well, I think we're quite a long way off from, for example, the majority of bacterial infections being resistant to antibiotics. It is a big problem um, across the world, and it's a growing one. The World Health Organization has said people in every country of every age um, are at risk of this. But, um, you know, there are preventative strategies, tightly controlling and regulating um, the use of antibiotics, perhaps um, even government incentives for yeah. pharmaceutical companies. To well, Lord, Lord O'Neill said, didn't he? We need to be more imaginative. We need, you know, new alternatives. There's, in China, for instance, there's a huge, I mean, the number one anti-malarial drug developed from traditional Chinese medicine. Not only did the drug come from it, but the method by which they extract the drug, artemisia, artemisine, ex extracted from artemisia, the method by which they extract it comes from Chinese traditional medicine from about 1000 AD. So uh, echinacea from the trad medical tradition of the North American Indians is certainly anti -effective, effective antiviral agent. We and as a prophylactic as well. Yes. I mean, I sometimes take it if I think a cold's coming on and it not Sure, sure. Ahead. Yes, pretty, pretty little flower too. Uh, so uh, we need to be more imaginative. We look, need to look at other possibilities. Uh, I mean, where I don't, are, don't where disagree are... with, with this you know, thing of we need more antivirus, we need to be better stewardship, but we also need to be more imaginative. Where are the big thinkers who are taking this forward? Because as Lord O'Neill said, look, we, we, we've got the Food and Agriculture Organization, World Health Organization, the United Nations has to take this seriously. Mm -hmm. So I think countries around the world are signing up to um, develop their own action plans around antimicrobial resistance. And with that comes incorporation of innovative new technologies. There's a longitude prize. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of vested interest um, in, in coming up with a solution for this and indeed throwing what we've got at this problem, whether it's... Well, do we need to subsidise drug companies to come up with the ideas because asking them to do it out of the kindness of their heart isn't going to work because they don't make enough money out of it? I think there are moves to do that, yeah, I think there are incentives that are being offered to, to the drug companies to, to do that. Oh. Are they listening? It has not translated into any new antibiotics yet, but certainly um, Dame Sally Davies, the NHS England Chief Medical Officer, has been um, talking about 
you know, potentially this is a route forward to actually getting some new antibiotics, not just in labs, because you might hear stories about a new antibiotic has been discovered, but often it's incredibly hard to scale that up to something that will actually one day mean something to patients. Who wants to wrap this up? I'm inclined to give it to Peter because he's been pushing his cause and what we're <laughs> talking about at the moment it just isn't working. Well, I, I say, I mean, I don't disagree with the O'Neill report. I say it's too narrow. I say we need to look at, there are a huge number of alternative complementary things out there. I'm involved with WHO, I'm a member of their traditional medicine advisory committee, and we are working on this, but actually it's hard to make headway. There is a prejudice that we need more antibiotics, we need modern medicine, and frankly, modern medicine is running out of road, and, and you know, despite a lot of efforts, it's a good 30 years since a new class of antibiotics was introduced. 30 years. Well, hopefully, as you suggest, perhaps the signs are encouraging that people are being taken seriously in, in the things they're putting forward. Because uh, Lord O'Neill, we, we did mention him in his report, which you believe didn't go far enough, but I, I think you believe was actually quite good. Um, he was uh, pretty dire in his warnings, talking about uh, the human and economic costs, as he put it, they compel us to act. If we fail to do so, he wrote in his report, in his conclusion, the brunt of these, the costs, will be borne by our children and grandchildren and felt most keenly in the poorest parts of the world. You've been watching Roundtable. Thank you all for coming on, for joining us on this programme. From me, David Foster, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time, I hope, for now. Bye-bye.